Uh, and so I want to thank this uh, huge crowd that we've got with us today. I mean, I think there are more people in this one session than I've taught in 23 years in higher education. So, um, so again, it's good to have all of you with us from Wales, from London, from Madrid, from Sydney. If you're waking up early in the morning like Shufang is in China, and, um, or if you're coming from Seoul or Mexico like I see in the window there, uh, Saudi Arabia. If you're coming from Houston or, you know, uh, I see Portugal, India, we got all sorts of places. Uh, so maybe maybe uh, if you're coming from another country, you might go ahead and type in where that country is so people can, if you're not coming from the U.S., A, go ahead and type in your country. We can get a sense of places people are coming from. Uh, but these slides have been posted. They're up in the, the course. If you go under week one, you can get a color PDF of everything that you can follow along with us. There also is a handout. Now, if you didn't get it, it's okay, but there's a handout to kind of walk you through the 10 principles of motivation we're going to be going through here with examples, and I'll have you checking off things that you can use, might use, or won't use. And if you didn't print it out or, or um, download it, you can still jump over and do that. It's in the week one resources um, underneath the link to this, um, to this session. So if you could link to the session, Karen from Whitewater, I miss my alma mater, UWW, the best team in Division Three football and basketball this year. Um, <laughs> I had to throw that in. Anyhow, uh, it's not here in Hoosierville. Good to have everyone with us from around the world here. Uh, again, those are, those are things you can get. I should also mention that I've put up two chapters of an upcoming book uh, I'm working on for free that's up in, in, the, in the course. And um, we've got chapter three and four. And I'm going to have you vote on the other additional chapter I'm going to put up. So we're going to have some voting at the end. I must have the, everyone here vote on how I'm going to publish it for free or through a publisher. You're going to all vote on this at the end. So um, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, maybe we should get uh, moved in here. My, my uh, free, I know, it's the best one, right? We should start with where people are coming from. Uh, North or South America would be an A. Um, Europe would be a B. Africa, a C. Middle East, uh, an, a D. And Australasia, New Zealand, Australia, Fiji, all that would be an E. If you type in, now you have to look underneath here. If you go, um, if you can't see the little tool, there's a little A button next to main room. If you look in the middle of your screen to the left, it says main room. Just to the left of that, there will be a vote, a place to vote next to the hand. Um, so between the hand button and the main room is a little A button. And you can vote however you want. You can change your vote. Uh, I see we got 13 people from Europe so far and 285 from North or South America. So. Um, you know, uh, Africa, two people. We're starting to publish some of these. The Middle East, uh, three. And Australasia, ten people. So uh, get a sense of where people are coming from. Again, that's in that button. Now, if you don't see the buttons, under your toolbar window or under your view window, it says Restore Default Layout under your view window. So if you don't see something there, just go under your view window and restore your defaults. Um, yeah, if that's an old student, a young student of mine. Okay, that's, we got this published, so we'll move on to the next question where, besides where you're coming. We can see North and South America, in particular North America. Um, I'm assuming we have a lot of Canadians with us. If you are from Canada, go ahead in the chat window and tell us where you're from in Canada or Mexico. If you're from Canada or Mexico, go ahead and chat in the chat. And if you're from South America, also put in the chat window so I can get a sense of that North and South America mix. Um, uh, Newfoundland is a great place to be. Halifax, I haven't been. Vancouver Island is just there. Stephen Downs. Hi, Stephen. Coming from oh, the Canadian Research Council, right? Good to have you with us, Stephen. Guadalajara. Homer, I know. Is that Canada? <laughs> All right. Let's do another polling question before we start. What time is it there? OK, we're going to clear the poll. Let's see what time it is. Morning, lunchtime, let's say anywhere between 11 and 1 or 2. Mid-afternoon, evening, late night, or early morning. Let's see where people are, have uh, you know, been coming from here today. So we'll see where, where folks are. And we can see most of the folks, it's about mid-afternoon. Um, we're still waiting on a lot of people to vote. But it seems like uh, you know, it's uh, West Coast time. It'd be mid-afternoon. Those of you in Vancouver Island, right? So, um, OK, that's the second polling question. All right. Some of you have voted. 
All right, we're going to go to the third polling question. Does this time work well for each of you this week? We're going to clear this out, and we're going to do a different kind of format. Hang on a second, to an ABC format. Yes is uh, works, no is it doesn't work, and uh, C is sometimes. Uh, Steve Madonna is with us here. Good to have you with us. I saw a few names just scroll by. I wanted to just double check. It's amazing who's all with us here. Uh, Stephen's from Nova Scotia, if I'm not mistaken. Are you from Halifax? I think it's Nova Scotia, right, Stephen? Song Yoon is with us. New Brunswick. That's right, New Brunswick. Song Yoon from Stanford, a former student. Good to have you, Song. Anita says baseball is going to interfere. Okay, so this, this seems to be a decent time, but again, we're not asking the people who aren't here. So how do we know if it's a really good time or not, right? So, <laughs> so poll number four, what's your emotional state right now? Are you happy <laughs> or not? Let's clear, we clear that one off, and we'll see if people are hit their happy buttons. Okay, we'll see if they got their happy pills with them today. Neutral, a bit sad, frustrated, trying to get in. A few people are frustrated here. Some people are a little sad. I know Shifang with your mother ill. You know it's a little, it's not the nice, the best time in the world. Lisa Neal, what do you got there? An A. Okay, very happy. It was her birthday recently, right, Lisa? So most of you are happy, are a little bit happy, somewhat happy. Okay, great. Good to have you with us. Number, number five, let's clear that one off, uh, Haziz, and let's go to number five here and go to a five part. Uh, is your internet blazingly fast, pretty fast, satisfactory, slow, or excruciatingly slow? All right. And, and you know, I'm assuming my video is coming through OK here, but uh, I, I don't know for sure. So uh, <laughs> not, not positive. So it looks like pretty fast. Overall, pretty fast, people's uh, internet speed. So a uh, few people are satisfactory. Nobody, you know, one person's, few people slow. No one's excruciatingly slow. That's a good sign. <laughs> we're, we're pretty happy. It's pretty fast. And it's a pretty good time. <laughs> a little jerky. I'm a little jerky right now. All right, I see that. OK. <laughs> All right, well, you know, if you're coming from Seoul, Korea, or Hong Kong, or Japan, or Latvia, and Netherlands, or Switzerland, it's OK. You know, you're coming from New Brunswick, it might be OK, right, Stephen? Uh, it's from Stanford, right, Song? It's OK. But, you know, um, six of the top ten cities in the world in terms of Internet speed are in Korea, and the other four are in Japan. So if you're in Korea, and, and you know, the Koreans still complain. I mean, they got this huge book project that, you know, that they've been working on to create e-books for K-12 free to the world. And they're still complaining with the fastest internet speed. When I spoke at EBS, the education broadcasting system there, they said we have 95% broadband. And the first question was, what to do about the digital divide? They're still concerned about the other 5%, and they should be. So even with the blazing fast places, we're still not totally satisfied. UK, it's OK. OK. What's a MOOC? My friend Gordon Lockhart said, you know, he put up the, this little caricature of a MOOC and said, I could share it all with you. Uh, I thought it was a, a nice portrayal, anyhow, to get you thinking about whether we're using Illuminate or Collaborate here, or we're tweeting on this event, or we're having discussions wrapped around it, or blog posts, all sorts of things that wrap around a MOOC a massive open online class. And my friend Martin from Moodle will get mad at me now, but MOOC, say it with me, MOOC. Okay? I'm sure Stephen didn't intend for me to be wearing a clown, uh, well, um, yeah, when he invented the word, or someone invented the word. Maybe it wasn't Stephen, but uh, MOOC, you know. We have my friends at King Khalid are doing MOOCs. I mean, people in Saudi Arabia are doing MOOCs. You know, I talked to my friend Abdullah there this weekend from King Khalid. He just happened to be online. And he said, yeah. So call number six, have you participated in a MOOC before? OK, we'll see if people have or not. OK, what is a MOOC? It's a massive open online class. A MOOC, that's what this is. Now, we could call it something else. I think Stephen, in fact, uh, was it in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, Stephen, where you had a re uh, response to an article and you said maybe MOOC's not the best word, and you had a better word for it, I think. You might want to put up some, you had like six suggestions that are better than MOOCs, but you know, this is at least a starting point. 
Uh, I think, you know, uh, check, take a look. I think you had some suggestions, but maybe not. Maybe it was someone else. It was, a, it was about six months ago, Stephen, or maybe a year ago. Uh, but there are other, yeah, maybe the word massive. I think David Wiley had a problem with the word massive. And other people did as well. So most of you have not participated in a MOOC before, so this may be different. And I'm going to run this MOOC, or Blackboard's going to run this MOOC. It's not just me; it's everyone. And just I've been reading blog posts, and some people really love Stephen, and they love George Siemens, who's now at Athabasca, and they love Alec Karofs and others, and David Wiley, who do MOOCs. And they're looking for that the, the way they set it up. And, and I'm going to do more like Ray Schroeder did last summer, more of a, prof, you know, a, a, I shouldn't say more like Ray Schroeder, but I, I, I was online with Ray, and I learned from Ray a bit. And um, I think what Stephen do and George do is fantastic, but I don't think I'm, I can do what they do. They're just fabulous, deep thinkers, reflective, all, you know, I, I, they're just three times smarter than I am. So we're going to go with, with someone who needs a brain like me, and we're going to try a little bit more, you know, maybe give you some practical things you can walk away with in here. My, I did help with Ray Schroeder's class last year, and um, he's, he gave a MOOC to 2,700 people um, from the University of Illinois at Springfield. He had to open up a MOOC, Free to the World, on uh, teaching online, uh, on uh, online learning today and tomorrow, where it's going. I'm going to take a slightly different spin on it and focus more on the pedagogy. Now, Ray had about 300 people every week, so not everybody showed up for the MOOC session, but uh, it was fun to participate and watch the, watch the flow. Now, Stephen's done things in Moodle, so we got Moodle with the MOOC. <laughs> Other people at Stanford, where, ya, where Song is, had uh, you know um, these AI courses, artificial intelligence courses, with 160,000 people, of which 23,000 passed, and of course, they were so successful in doing it, they started up their own company. They've actually put up a lot of courses for Stanford Engineering Everywhere. Now, this is September 15th. You saw some news early. Let me go back here. August 2nd, right after Ray's class or when it was ending, Stanford said, we can do even you know, more than what Ray was doing. And they one-upped him a bit, although I, I don't think Ray felt slighted at all. I think he set the, you know, Stephen and David and, and, and George and Alec all set the stage for what happened at Stanford. It, spl it exploded. And as a result, people have spun out their own companies like Udacity and Coursera and all their new firms are just springing up to offer courses to 50,000 people at a crack or 100,000 people at a crack. Other people say, Putting this stuff up in a podcast format, or you know, reading Stephen's blogs, or reading um, wiki books, or whatever, helps flip the classroom. We can web stream our lectures and put them up. So, hey, Tom, Major Tom is with us. Ground control to Major Tom. I'm glad you're here with us, Major Tom, from Sweden. Invite us all to Sweden, Major Tom. It's good to see you with us. Um, so we can flip the classroom now, right? I'm, Major Tom is in the military there. He sent me stuff recently. I'll be flipping the classroom. We got Joshua Kim here at Inside Higher Ed. He's talking. His article is talking about flipping the classroom with technology. He just got back from Korea, where it's ubiquitous. The Seoul is ubiquitous city, and they can put all the lectures up online and have people watch them before coming to class. And so we have, you know, schools around the country who are doing that. We have MIT now taking their twenty. 300 classes on the web or more, and uh, offering them to people in Afghanistan and Iraq and Albania and, and Egypt, and, and getting them certificates wrapped around completion, MITx. We're getting new forms of universities, new forms of schools, new forms of corporate training centers as a result of all of this. We have badges, as, as Jarl mentioned, and if Sarah uh, bishop Root comes on from Blackboard, she'll talk about the badges here that you'll be getting for completing this class. You know, some of you will be getting some, some uh, maybe I'll be sending you some currency or some exchange money or some. Others of you will be getting brains and, and other kinds of things. But um, you'll get something from this. I might give a few books away and so forth. And you know, we got Sal Salman Khan really changing some of the discussion here with his talk at Stanford, where Song was a couple of months ago. He alluded me to this, as well as his TED Talks, getting us to rethink, reinvent, revolutionize or transform education. He's a starting point. I'm not saying 
he is the place to go or he's the one to listen to. Remember, he comes from a finance background like I do. I'm a CPA and an accountant, okay? Don't believe any of us. Um, go to educators who know better, okay? Um, April 18th comes around and Coursera is in the Chronicle of Hire at another open source platform. So all this news all of a sudden is coming up. And last week, we got MIT saying, you know, we got Salman Khan saying, could you please get your doctoral students and master's students and undergrads create videos for K-12? And now they've, they're doing it. They're doing videos on, you know, digital movie making or whatever it happens to be for first graders, third graders, sixth graders, eighth graders, and so forth. MIT plus K-12. They also have MIT Open Courseware for Advanced Placement High School. So is this a revolution? Poll number seven, a yes-no question here. Is this a revolution? Yes or no? Coming at us today. And I am cognizant of time. <laughs> is this a revolution? We'll see what people think. So far, pe people are in somewhat agreement. You know, we're flipping the classroom all around. I hate to flip too far because I could get disconnected. It's happened a few times when I've done that. I could jump up and down and say, we're, we're changing the world here. Let's all jump with me. I'm a, you know, count three, jump, jump, jump. You know, the world is changing. My cell phone just fell off or my dumb phone just fell off. But anyhow, we're at a jumping off point today. Read Stephen Down's old daily blog. We're at a jump. Read Josh Kim's Inside Higher Ed. Read Lisa Neal's stuff at, at eLearn Magazine. You'll see that all these people are talking about this new world we're entering into. Right? It's an evolution. Go to evolution. Yeah, there's actually something called the evolution with three L's on it. Take a look at that website. Mm. Okay. So, you know, many kids today are coming into my classes and sleeping, I hope not, but they're coming into classes and saying, you know, you're, you need to engage me better. And this is true of face-to-face -face and online environments. Michael Wesch from Kansas State said, you know, kids are, to, are bored with the way we approach education today in these large section college classes. And I went inside that class where this video was taken a few months ago and, and did some filming myself, interviewed Michael. You can go to my blog and read about how he's helping trying to transform the world or change things, his vision of today's students. His, his YouTube videos went viral. The Machine is Us Using Us and this one. Ten million people have watched it and debated and discussed how to get kids out of this sleepy mode, you know, and how to excite and engage them into learning. You know, when, when Artie Duncan spoke at the South by Southwest conference last month or a month and a half ago, he said Mooresville, North Carolina, is a shining example of what's possible and I went to the website and saw this kid closing his eyes. I'm not so sure that's a shining example, but anyhow, um, so much for, you know, Arnie had a lot of good points that he made. You can read about that in my blog. April 15th, Chronicle of Higher Ed says, can colleges manufacture motivation? You know, we've got these books coming at us on, you know, motivation, you know, and, and what to do, how to reward employees, and, you know, 1,001 ways and all that kind of stuff. Um, Lots of books on motivation, a lot of people who are suggesting how to change things in terms of motivation. So my, my million dollar question is, how do we motivate learners? What words come to mind? And you can type them in the chat window. What words come to mind? Engage. Daniel Pink's book's a good one, actually. That's a good book. You can get them to set goals, right? You know, this book here, The Highest Goal, is one of the best books I read. I think it's a Stanford professor, The Secret That Sustains, sustains You in Every Moment. It's a really good book about engagement. Um, yeah, highly recommend it. Passion, involvement, relevance, curiosity, puzzles, interactivity, quality, choice, real world, creativity. We'll get to creativity in week three. Week four, by the way, says Q&A, um, but we're actually going to do Q&A first hour. and second hour, I'm going to present more for my you know, because my friends are waking up in Asia a little bit late, so we're going to do a delay, a flip. We're going to flip the classroom, do a one-hour discussion, Q&A, and then an hour presentation on shared online video, and then more Q&A. Group learning, meaningfulness, thank you, Lynn. Relationships, Cheryl, fun, Glenn. Okay. Well, I've been thinking about this, and I'm um, reading Jerry Brophy's research, and he talks about all these things, fun and feedback and enthusiasm and goals and challenge and so forth, supportiveness, discovery, right? Um, making it personal, product-based, uh, giving feedback, number two, goal setting, 
VCN Ryan quoted in Daniel Pink's book said, you know, we really have to foster this inner sense of curiosity, this inner striving uh, to look at, um, you know, seeking out instead of just receiving knowledge, to flip us around a bit, to not just be browsing the internet but actively contributing to it, to engage in one's interests and making it meaningful. I reflected on this in Hawaii a couple of years ago and I had this peak moment at the end of the road to Hana and something magical happened that the tech variety model just entered my brain. And this tech variety model stands for tone, encouragement, curiosity, variety. You like the shirt? It's a good shirt right there. <laughs> my son took that picture. Curiosity, variety, autonomy, uh, relevance, interactivity, engagement, tension, and yielding products. You know, Maslow said tone and climate, psychological safety. B.F. Skinner said feedback, responsiveness, and supports. And I worked with B.F. Skinner's daughter and husband at West Virginia University, or West by God Virginia University. Um, we won't say, you know, what it was like working between two behaviorologists, but, um, you know, I think he had a point about feedback, and it's very apparent online. And, you know, Piaget said we need challenge and dissonance and tension. Roger Shank says we need goals, goal-driven behavior, and yielding products. Each one of these could be deemed the most important. Yeah, I, you know B.F. Skinner's daughter and husband? Both of them, uh, Julie Vargas and Ernie Vargas, good people. Um, you know, each one of these could be deemed the most important. I could make a case for tone. My courses went from 30% drops to zero drops by adding social icebreakers, okay? But tone and climate have nothing to do with learning, but everything to do with learning, you see. I could make a case for products. If students have a product to vote for, yeah, you want you want that top banana. Okay, I can't, I can't, yeah. So, you know, you can make a, some of you, of course, are fishing for answers to your questions right now, but anyhow. So, you know, every, autonomy and choice to me is pretty darn important. Relevance and meaningfulness, interactivity. So what I'm going to do is walk you through some examples on each of those 10 levels during the next 25 minutes or so. And I want you to think about and use the sheets that's been passed around and write inside there whether you can use them or not. If you don't have one of these sheets that says whether or not you can use any of these strategies, you can just use a sheet of paper or your brain and write down which of these could you use, which are low risk, low cost, low time. Like, you know, Bill Murray and What About Bob? We're going to take baby steps, baby steps, baby steps, you know, and, um, you know, little baby steps. And low risk, just start you off with some simple things you can do online. Others of you will want to do high risk, high cost, high time kinds of things. So we'll see where you are on the risk continuum, on the time time continuum, on the cost and on the instructorness center, instructor center, student centered end of things, right? So the first one I said has nothing to do with content, but everything to do with content. If you have adult learners and you get them to make commitments to your class in a discussion forum or in a blog or somewhere that's public, they're less likely to drop the class because they've made that commitment. If you have them post their expectations of what you're going to accomplish, you can point out I have them do, do expectations. I, have, I, I can say we're going to get to that in week 8 or week 10. And so they don't drop in week 2 because Dr. Bach's never going to get to it. Well, I'm gonna, I, I know they want to get to it. I know what they're committed to. I know what they're in, and sharing their favorite websites, but always giving feedback to one another on them. Share their eight nouns. Go to moms who think. Share their eight adjectives, verbs. All these are hot links. If you want my original slides, write me a note. Happy to send you the link. But these are posted in um, the MOOC, the PDF is. Uh, but have them post, you know, I'm a, I'm a pirate, you know, I'm a pirate and I'm a, I'm a music lover and I'm, you know, a bookworm, I'm a road runner and so forth, you know. Hey, matey. Uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> you know, we've got uh, all these nouns that can describe who it is, who you are as a learner. Uh, verbs and so forth. It gets people to talk to one another about, you know, their interests, their hobbies, their life experiences. They can find out more about each other. And now today, more so students are posting video introductions. Instructors are posting short videos like I did. Mine was a bit long, 12 minutes. That's a bit long for one. I admit that. The first two takes were five minutes. Those were better, but okay. So, <laughs> you know, little, you know, the woman there holding up the French in action teaches at NOVA, 
uh, Mike Wangers with us, Northern Virginia Community College. The guy in the bottom right, Mike, he's from our business school, like you're in the business school. The, 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 on the right hand side is an art class in Malaysia. I know we got people in Malaysia. That's a K-12 class. I want to address K-12 and higher ed here. You know, we got people in Pennsylvania creating websites on the muscular system with, with feedback from the computer. That's, that's encouraging system feedback, online self-testing. In the UK, they have, over in Leicester, they have a slice them and dice them website, an autopsy website where you figure out how people died. All cases on the web. Here in Indiana, we have the COM system, computer assisted learning method for chemistry and physics. It's a free tool, open source um, self testing system. Anyone can use it for any discipline. Look up COM in Indiana University. But the guy in the muscular system at Penn State had 200 students in his class. And 200,000 people in one month alone use the website. One person can change the world, you see. That's the point of all this. You all can do something to change the world. Did I skip over one? Encouragement and feedback. Having screencasts. Just capturing things in Jing or GoView or Screener. Walking people through the MOOC. We could have done a Screener webcast for you to see where to click to do a survey. You know, we probably should do one and post it up so you know where to click on the survey. You know how to post to a blog. Give them, you know, some help and some support systems. The most famous guy there on the right-hand side, the Free Grain of Rice website, is from, he's the most famous guy in Bloomington, Indiana, in the e-learning space. Because he saw his son struggling with SATs and the ACTs, so he created a website for vocabulary. And this went viral. There's now geography and art and, you know, art history and Spanish and English. And every time you get a question right, free grains of rice are donated to third world countries. How cool is that? There's also other vocabulary websites to prep you for exams, for high school and college exams and whatever you're going to take. The vocab sushi. Online accounting. I was an accountant. You can see on the right hand side, I got the question wrong like I always did. I, you know, was, you know, and you know, slapped up the side of the head like my accounting professors would do to me. Sorry, Karen's there, Karen Skibet. Whitewater, you know, my name's on the wall somewhere, America's dumbest accountant or something, you know. So I was quickly out of there. So I, this is a website from Canada. Um, forget what city they built this in, but this is automatic feedback on your accounting. You don't have to wait a week for an accounting instructor to give you feedback. Here in the U.S., in Franklin University in Columbus, Ohio, where Yi is from, I think Yi's joined us, you know, they've got uh, cost accounting, forensic accounting up on the web so you can see different cost analyses, which I, which I would have had as a you know, major, it would have helped me out a lot, interviewing someone in a forensic accounting situation and giving you feedback on your interviewing skills or on your solutions and so forth. Polling, poll everywhere. You can you know, pull out your cell phone and take a poll if you want to and just type in. Not a dumb phone with a keyboard on it. I don't have a smartphone yet because I'm dumb, as I said. My Korean friends gave me this phone. They said, you dumb Americans, you can have this dumb phone. So um, yeah, they gave me the camera too when I was there in September because I dropped mine. Anyways, nice people in Korea, they buy me stuff so I have technology wrapped around me. But you know, blog everywhere, poll everywhere, micro poll. Poll your student. We're doing it in here, right? Anita's going to get me a droid for my birthday. Thank you, Anita. Ah, <laughs> so polling people and feedback. It's not just giving feedback to students, but feedback from students to the instructor. You know, having students with these response systems, right? These little clicker systems and have you click your responses, whether you're using Socrative or whatever tool you're using for, you know, students to give you feedback. Now, I once did a session to Toronto where we remo remote access the desktop from Toronto back to Bloomington, Indiana over video conferencing, very cool stuff. People at York University do cool stuff and I could show them the results as they click the response system over the video conferencing. Really cool stuff. And that was like seven years ago or something. I mean, Canadians are way ahead of us. Out of everybody, Canadians, Australians, the Finns, the Brits, uh, yeah, and now the Saudis are catching up. You know, number three is curiosity, fun, and games. Online news. Yeah, every day your class could start with something happening in the news. You can just go through the BBC and CNN and whatever, and you can include little videos, you know, of something curious that's happened in the news, and 
embed it as an as a icebreaker or as a advanced organizer. Not advanced organizer, there's no such thing as advanced, but advanced, coming before instruction. Have them reflect on it. Have them play a word game to practice the concepts you're learning in class or practice their math. Um, have them get involved. In, if you're more serious, my friends in the Army, and I'm, I've been working with the Department of Defense and Army Research Institute on massive multiplayer online gaming stuff, and, and we're just starting a new project, actually. But they're very serious, as Major Tom knows, about, uh, about gaming online. If you haven't been to Wolfram Alpha, check out Stephen Wolfram's website. Now, he says he's the next Einstein, or people say he is. I'm not sure. But you get everything here. Healthcare data, geographic data, you know, um, chemistry information, stock market exchanges, public school financing. You can do a comparison and contrast of North Korea and South Korea economics, or South Korea and the US. Um, so it's not just data. You know, kids get their calculus assignments answered in Wolfram Alpha. It's a pretty dangerous site if you don't want them to have the answers. But take a look at this one if you want to inspire curiosity. In, you know, inspiring curiosity of people. All these interesting biography websites, famous people website, top you know, women who changed the world, uh, people who have changed the world. Have them track someone in Twitter. Have them track someone through the blog. Have them write them an, uh, a, a message and get some feedback from someone. You know, have them involved in a video conference like this where you might be stretching the edges of what's possible in your, in your classes, right? Have them involved in a video conference. Here at Indiana, we have the International Studies for Indiana Schools. And Deb Houghton at the top right, and Mimi Lee below her, now at the University of Houston, my colleague. They, Mimi's dissertation was on video conferencing. White homogenous kids in Indiana, in southern Indiana, talking to people in Korea about cooking or about you know, Japanese tea ceremonies, people in Japan or in Egypt, not just talking about pyramids, but video today to open our minds up to what's possible. Everybody should be doing this stuff. Um, it's free. Find out what's happening in Sudan or in Eastern Europe or wherever. Adventure learning. If you've taken a look at my extreme learning website, you know we're exploring adventure learning. The bottom right, those are explorers at the northern part of you know, the world holding up the IU flag while interacting with kids around the world about their projects, about their researches. You know, today there's so many bicycle expeditions, um, car expeditions, people sailing boats around the world. These are ways to excite people into learning, right? We've got cartoons. Kids are making cartoons in my class, Animoto and uh, Biz Strips and other things. Uh, my friend Zad, Zaid, Zaid Learn over in Malaysia, I think some of you know Zaid, he's quite a character. He's using all these cartoon kinds of things, Go Animate's another one, to animate his talks. Okay? Um, oh, someone does know Dr. Lee there. Okay, so um, yeah, I know her quite well. Say hi from me. Uh, variety, number four. Get us, you know, students control. I have my students who are taking over my class. They sign up to be the cool resource provider. Everybody gets, in my face-to-face -face class, five minutes of fame. They stand up in front at the beginning and show us websites, show us videos, uh, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Or online, they're putting things up in the wiki. They're putting things up in the discussion forums. They're the cool resource provider for the week. This extends what I know. This extends what the class has. And now I can use that stuff next time. So you don't have to build everything. Use the cool resource provider ideas and let them build out what's possible in the class. Let them do some things in the class. Um, also have them be a technology demonstrator. If you demonstrate a technology, delete any assignment you want. Give them control. A little variety in the class doesn't hurt. Maybe have a randomizer tool, you know, instead of having these physical dice that you might roll and, and so forth, you might have virtual dice or virtual coin flippers or randomizers, so you might sequence the presenters in a different way. Craig Ketchum's with us. Hey, Craig. Philly's with us. Hey, Philly. Fred. Um, you might have all these randomizing tools, right? Clocks and dice, 99-second counters I use all the time. I have these countdown bombs. Everybody gets 99 seconds to speak. After 99 seconds, they're done. Okay? And that way they have to get things in a nice summary for us, um, condense it down, and everyone gets their 99 seconds of fame or two minutes or 10 minutes, just vary varying things a bit. It's a way to support them. You might bring in guest experts coming from 
you know, Antarctica studying penguins, or my friend John Traxler, the, um, the mobile learning chair in the UK coming from Wolverhampton, or my friend over here, Sarah Robbins with her pink hair coming to talk about Second Life for Dummies. And, you know, Sarah is um, pretty famous in, as in Telegirl than Second Life. And she pops in. She lives three blocks from my house, but she still pops in virtually. And her husband, Mark Belly, is pop in and talk about virtual worlds. Bring them in. Get your students excited about somebody you can bring into your class. Bring in Stephen Downs. I brought him into my class two years ago. He was fabulous talking about personalized learning. Okay, I brought in John Traxler, and I brought in all, you bring in all sorts of people, right? Um, everyone knows in Telegirl, eh? Skype, record these webinars like they're doing here. You're recording this for other people so they can come online later and watch it and share it and discuss it and debate it, okay? Guest experts in Skype, guest experts, what was that other tool out there? WizIQ. These are free tools you can use. Of course, there's a bumped or upgraded Skype that's fairly cheap you can use um, to get 10 or more people in a synchronous video conference together. Um, Vim Vim, you know, Illuminate, just go to Course Sites. I mean, look at Course Sites offers you lots of things, and in week five, Blackboard's going to explain that. Now, this is not a promotion for Blackboard. If you know me, I know the president of Desire to Learn, good friend from Canada, I, the Moodle, uh, M Martin is a close friend, and, you know, Angel came out of IU. Um, I would have thought the last place they would ask me to do a talk like this would be Blackboard. So fear not. I'm not out here promoting Blackboard, okay? Um, but I do think what they're doing here is interesting. And so, you know, I, uh, ha, 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 thank you, Stephen. So here we have Blackboard's tool as one thing that you could be using. But sure, yeah, I am promoting it here within, this, within the MOOC. And so we've got number four. Variety, novelty, fun, and fantasy. My friend Amy Burvell does History for Music Lovers, where you can learn about the French Revolution, the Trojan War, Charlemagne, um, the American Revolution, uh, Henry VIII. She does music, 80s music, 70s music, 90s music, and today, Lady Gaga, Madonna, to uh, history. If you haven't seen History for Music Lovers, check it out. A little variety. I'm going to talk about racing. Uh, racing's in my blood. And if you haven't seen her Trojan War one, Stephen, um, that, was, um, that was soft cell, tainted love. It is quite, quite, quite good. I'm, I play it all the time, actually. I was born in Milwaukee, and my uncles and my grandfathers, they loved racing. And they took me to the racetrack every day as a kid growing up. And um, Arlington Racetrack was where I just hung out. And, you know, my whole family is gamblers. My mom's a one-armed bandit. The whole family is gamblers. So I can't, I can't bet any money. I can't. There's millions of dollars that my family has spent online, you know, or in racetrack. So and the priest asked us in, in third grade in Catholic school who knew what a, what a bookie was. I was the only kid and a thousand kids in church who knew what one was. You know, jockeys are important. We've got all sorts of jockeys out there. But today we've got Google jockeys. And a Google jockey is someone who can access the Internet and showcase what, you're, what people are presenting about. So you can give someone an, an expert role, give someone some identity as the Google jockey for the week or for the day or for the hour if it's a face-to-face -face class. If it's an online one, you might repurpose it somehow. Someone who's exploring and showcasing so you don't have to do everything. Autonomy and choice. Autonomy and choice. Having kids go to the Khan Academy, having them go to Learning Zillion to learn their math, to learn their spelling, or whatever task it is that you're trying to teach. Give them choice among the videos. In my classes, I have seven to ten videos every week, and students pick three to watch, and then we discuss them. They have choice in the videos. They have choice of the content. You might give them a portal of stuff. If you're teaching literature, you might have Timeless Hemingway, or Jane Austen, or Edgar Allan Poe, or Shakespeare, and have them go to uh, these resources and review them. I have lists that my students pick and choose from and then review and discuss from the portal choice. So number eight, we're at the end of the, the first section here. We're going to be switching over here in a second, not yet. Any light bulbs going off in your head so far? A is yes, B is maybe, C is no. I know I have a light bulb. I think I have a light bulb. A light bulb with me here. Okay, we got light bulbs. 
Okay, so this is the first section. We have about 10 minutes left for the second part of this, and then we'll go to a break and we'll do Q and A's. So um, hopefully you got some things in the first half. So we've gone through tone, encouragement, curiosity, variety, and autonomy. And so far we've got a couple people saying none yet. So hopefully in the second half maybe you pick up on a few um, maybes. We've got 90 people, and definitely yes, is 177 with uh, 197 left to, to post something. So that means we've got, I, I can't, you know, I'm a former, we've got about 500 people in here perhaps. Okay, next poll. Which of the five motivational principles will you use the most? Let's clear that first poll and go to the second poll. It should be a five-part poll, not a three-part. There we go. Sorry, we have to change. Try it again. Sorry. Tone or climate. Encouragement or feedback. Curiosity or fun. Variety, novelty. Autonomy, choice, and relevancy. Again, you've got the handout. You can be going through no, yes, and maybe. While this is coming up, I can read that uh, you know Tone got 51 votes so far, and um, encouragement, support, 74, curiosity, 53, and uh, then we get into variety, 44, and autonomy, 53. It's pretty evenly split, with the most votes so far going to um, relevance. So why don't we post those um, for people to read, Aziz? Maybe we can get that. Um, I'm not sure if you can post the um, the results of this one here. Maybe I can under tools. And uh, as that's coming up here, let's see if I can find that um, publish responses. Whoops, did that go away? Let's try and publish that again. There we are. Good deal. So you can see that there's a lot of people um, posting on that one. Okay, let's go to the second set of slides there. I think you had them called up already, so um, maybe they're just right behind here. I'm not sure. There they are, sure enough. So we've got my friend Mark Braun here in, in um, and maybe I have to, we have to take this one away, but um, I have my friend Mark Braun there at um, the School of Medicine at IU. Relevance and meaningfulness for him is putting cases up online, videos of cases, uh, audios of cases, text-based cases that students are solving. A man with a cold, a woman with a chest pain, uh, someone with a fast pulse, and so forth. Uh, so relevance and meaningfulness, number six, online case learning. And since 1997, I've been doing case-based learning with student teachers based on field experiences. They reflect on the field and connect the field work to their class contents. Relevance and meaningfulness, high school literature. My friend Jenny Zoyer, and I hear a audio coming behind me. Okay, it's done. My friend Jenny Sawyer does 60 second recap. She summarizes books. Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Macbeth, A Catcher in the Rye, whatever. She summarizes in 60 seconds. She does 10 60 second summaries for every book. The theme, the characters, the actors. It's cliff notes in video format and it's all free for high school literature. Kurt. Relevance and meaningfulness. CNN. Charles. Yeah, I just wanted to ask. Yeah. It looks, um, I hope he's uploaded the slides, but I think that there's a slight delay with it loading for the participants presently, so we might want to oh. um, just give that a moment. Okay. Sorry, is everyone with me here on um, slide? It says six relevance meaningfulness tour of the online drilling site. How many of you see that? Maybe we should type a yes, no on there. Um, so we get a yes, no responses there, Hafiz. Can you, yeah, so go ahead and click yes, no if you can see that. A couple people still waiting to load. Okay. All right. 215 of you say yes. Four of you say no. I'll give it another second. Shufang, not seeing it yet in China. Okay, so it's taking a little while for these to load over there to China. I think that's what you said. Or is it loading there in China, Shufang? I'll maybe get a quick drink. Okay. So, you know, BP oil spill, every day, we've got, you know, new data coming in during that. If you're teaching petroleum engineering, what an ideal time to be, you know, to incorporate web-based data, real-world data, authentic data into your class. If you have virtual teams, you might be using Kalenos or Ning or SharePoint or something to have teams work together in Wikispaces or PBWorks or, you know, some wiki tool 
your wiki books, to work in virtual teams on ideas online, interactive and collaborative learning. These are students in Malaysia working with my students. You might have students interacting with video. You can annotate video. I have a student, Craig Howard, there in the bottom right doing a dissertation on how to use video and annotate videos. And in week four, we'll talk more about this. But if you're interested, his article is in the International Journal of Designs for Learning. International Journal of Designs for Learning, a free open access journal, just came out on how to annotate YouTube videos. So it's not just boring talking head stuff. You can actually comment on them and interact with one another within them. You can highlight you know, text in your iPad. And I just got my iPad. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I've yet to use this. So maybe I'll raffle it off or something. I don't know. I, I'm too dumb to use this thing. So um, I'm stuck. I'm a PC person. I don't know anything about Apple. I'm <laughs> so you can highlight books, right? Um, make text notes in a book. Uh, send your ideas to one another in your book. Look at videos wrapped around it. Um, that's personal interactivity. It's learner content interactivity. It's not learner-learner interactivity. There's learner-instructor interactivity. There's learner-self uh, interactivity, reflecting on what you've learned. So all sorts of ways to think about interactivity. Monica Rankin's class at UT Dallas had a YouTube video of their Second Life experience where they role played Barack Obama talking to Reagan, Carter, and other former presidents, um, Clinton, about how they dealt with Fidel Castro during the Cuban Revolution and since then. Fascinating if you click on that link later on and watch the results of students seeing other perspectives, interacting with one another, females taking the roles of Bill Clinton or uh, Barack Obama and so forth. Again, interactive and collaborative, having students work up. Um, and like we're doing here, we're talking in Google Docs about the themes every week in here. We'll be having more themes being posted in the MOOC. Um, if you've been to Stevens or Ray Schroeder's or other MOOCs, you know they're very good at posting the themes or the, the threads or the, you know, the postings. We haven't done a good job of that so far, but that's coming. The Change MOOC is a case in point, thanks Stephen, where people have done that. Take a look at the Change MOOC, a very fascinating one. Uh, online language learning. To me, this is exploding. Live Mocha, Babbel, Kentalk, ECPod, ways to get people to use Skype or their headsets to converse. Live Mocha has gone from a million people online two years ago to 10 million. You can sign up to take a language like Hindi, or, right, Anita, or um, Spanish, or uh, Arabic, right, Aziz, or some other language. Or to teach it or take it many websites, and we're, we're now researching how these are being used. My son has been working with Paul Kim at Stanford on the SMILE project, Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning Environments. They went to Tanzania, where kids were typing in their mobile phones questions for one another, inquiry-based questioning of each other to get literacy skills. Kids are typing stories, and these stories are sold as iPhone apps, and the money gained from that goes back to the community as social entrepreneurship, interactive and collaborative getting kids to interact about content on their mobile phones, type in responses, like we're doing here in the polling. There's my son in the middle. He's the Korean kid there in the middle. His name's Alex, surrounded by all these kids in Tanzania a couple months ago. I just thought I'd throw that in there. He's up in Chicago looking for a job, if anyone's got one in multimedia design. Number eight, engagement and effort, visualizing data to see the Enron crisis quickly in front of you. In two minutes, you learn more than you could from reading the paper in five years. Flash animations, visualization of lab experiments, chemistry and biology and physics. Uh, visualize randomization of groups or chi-square analyses, engagement and effort. Visualize the Indianapolis 500. See what cars are in the lead at different laps. Do gas mileage calculations in a math class. I know here in Indianapolis, I know we have Indianapolis teachers in here right now, they take their kids to the track, and they do, they take the counters out, and they clock kids and the times, right? They're doing this all the time in math classes. Well, now on the web, the Indy Star posts who's in the lead at different points. You can do all sorts of math wrapped around it. I see we're at a point. Here we go. Um, virtual timelines. When Steve Jobs died, the same day CNN and the USA Today posted a timeline of his life. When Bill Gates retired, there's a timeline of his life. Timelines are powerful. Concept maps are powerful because it's thought on paper. Connections. Here you can look at the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s. 
and 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 see what and reflect on what your life was like, right? Yeah, I see you like time. What your life was like in 1980s? What your life is like, you know, today? Some of you are waiting for the slide to appear. Okay, I'll slow down for a second. Some of you still say no slides. Let me go back a second and go back to the indie timeline tool and maybe click ahead and see if you all have it now. Um, how many of you, let's post a poll here, how many of you don't see the timeline or do see yes or no? Yes, you see it. No, you don't. We'll just get a sense. I see a lot of people don't see this one yet. But timelines, hyper history tool, you know, seeing all of history in a timeline. Seeing, you know, we've got 15 people who don't see it, 216 who do. So about 10% are still waiting for this to load. Okay, so I'll, I'll pause here again for another couple of seconds, waiting for yours to load there. Um, okay. I think this is, you know, to compare and contrast lives, like, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs' life, to compare and contrast, you know, technology over the decades, to look at what technology looked like in the 1800s or 1700s. New York, the New York Times had an article last year for K-12, looking at technology from the, 18, from the 1600s to today. These timeline tools that the newspapers are coming out with are reusable as content in your online classes. We should be looking to newspapers. I mean, if there's one thing, don't, don't rely on publishers for all this. Their publishers like Pearson are great, okay, fine. But newspapers, uh, Wired Magazine, uh, you name it, are putting up very interesting content you can embed in your classes. So hopefully you, you're on with me. You can, if you haven't seen The Guardian's Arab Spring, in The Guardian Arab Spring, you click on a country like Iran or Bahrain or Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Libya, and time. There's actually a tool that lets you move into time. It's called a navigator tool, and you move along this timeline. It's one of the most coolest timelines I've seen, and you see different months come at you, weeks and days, and you can click on a link, and the article comes up. How cool is that? I mean, it's extremely interactive. If you're teaching anything about Middle Eastern history and you're not using this tool, oh my God, or goodness, um, or Allah. Um, engagement, effort. Virtual field trips. You know, Pearson has a virtual field trip of, you know, what life was like immigrating to Ellis Island in the U.S. or, or wherever you're immigrating to in the world. They have video footage. They have, they have pictures. They have reflections. All sorts of things. March 21st, they had this announced. Al Jazeera has something similar. Okay. Interactive simulations, engagement, and effort. All sorts of interactive simulations that you might have online. So you can be using these kinds of things in your classes, right? And, um, and so hopefully you might have a, a physics simulation or a biology simulation, something you can augment your classes with, blend your classes with. My friend Randy Garrison and Norm Vaughn up in Canada in Calgary and the Royal Roads or Mount Royal have a great book on blended learning. You know, I have a, I have a stu this book's kind of expensive, so don't get my blended learning, get, get theirs. It's cheaper, it's better, it's more relevant, and so forth. Um, you know, ours is a big picture. Theirs will tell you what to do. Um, but take a look at what's happening, you know, in terms of supplementing your classes with interactive stuff. Debates, ethical debates on stem cell, ethical debates on this Human Body Worlds exhibit, having kids discuss topics in the news that, you know, their parents and grandparents are talking about as well, or people in the community are talking about. Challenge them, like Piaget said. Get them into dissonance. To motivate, get them into dissonance or competitions. If you haven't read the works of Rick Bennett at the University of New South Wales, you're missing out on something. Rick is one of the most thoughtful, interesting, engaging people I've ever met. And he's not from education. He's, he's a sculptor. He's a designer. He's interested in having kids design things that help the world, designing t-shirts on AIDS for kids in Africa, designing plants of original flowers in the, the Philippines, um, and competitions wrapped around it with experts, expert designers, expert photo media people giving feedback in the Omnium project. Omnium is free tool. If you haven't seen Omnium, take a look at Omnium. It's a way to get people to collaborate around the world. Tension and challenge. One of my students, Kim, who's going to be a TA in this class, Kim Sieber, she created a website here. And I don't know if she's got Steven's picture in here or not, but she's got a number of people, including Henry Jenkins and, um, and Ray Schroeder and, and others. Um, as you click on their picture, and there's Steven in there, you have to click on 
um, what their identity is, who, what they're known for. It's a game show she built based on our class. That was her final project, a challenge game show. She just submitted this last week. I thought I'd throw this in there. So all the readings we did, she tried to summarize what Paul Kim had said. She tried to summarize what Peter Smith at Kaplan had said and other people, Mike Mayrath at Austin. Um, others of my students do video production, YouTube videos. Shuya and Yua did a video. They're also TAs in this class. They'll be helping out. They did a video on blogging. Miguel Laura, fascinating guy here in our instructional consulting office, did a video on the Web 2.0. That'll be, it's a fascinating, Miguel did a wonderful job of that video. My students do these and we have movie nights. They share, we have popcorn nights. Miguel created a, a, an acronym called FREEDOM. Flexibility, rapport, expression, e-collaboration, digital games, open resources, and motivation. My students, you know, doing this, other kids, I met this 21-year-old this teacher in the Philippines two months ago. She did a video for her kids of my talk. And then the kids, the one first grader she was teaching did a video back to me. And she has her channel. She's a first year teacher with her own YouTube channel. She has an introduction to the private school she produced for the whole school. She's 21 years old. Amazing stuff. You know, um, her name is Hannah. And actually, Hannah, I don't know if you're joining us here, Hannah, or not. She's actually visiting people in Irvine this week, I think. So I'm not sure if she's joined. But just phenomenal what's possible today from, you know, very young ages to people in, in nursing homes and centenarians, you know, whether we create our own YouTube channels. I have a YouTube channel that we're going to look at in week four with 27 videos on how to teach online. It's called the V Portal. If you click on the V Portal, Indiana University has given to the world these videos on how to teach online. We'll talk about them. You can take them, reshape them, share them, even sell them. I don't care. We put a pretty liberal Creative Commons license on these things. So take a look. We'll talk about them in a few weeks. Some of my students say, Dr. Bunk, I don't want to just blog. I want to do a video blog. They want a challenge. They want better goals. My student, Justin, he's another TA, the guy in the bottom right with his mouth open. Hi, Justin. Just kidding. So um, Justin's going to help us out too. So final polls, then we'll have a break. Which of these last five principles do you use the most? Relevance or meaningfulness? We'll get the five-part poll up there. Engagement or effort. Interactive, collaborative, and community-based. Tension and challenge and dissonance. And yielding products or goals. We'll see what people are using. Which of these last will you use, it should say. I guess I, didn't, I read that wrong. And so I said, do you? Will you use? You can change your answer. You can definitely change your answer. You see a lot of people voting in the um, relevance and meaningfulness category. A lot of people in the interactive, collaborative, and community-based. And there are some blog posts here about whether this MOOC is community-based enough. And, and we'll be modifying this a bit and making, it, um, making some adjustments that we already have during the past week to, to address this community issue. That's a very important one to me. Um, tension and challenge, the least amount of votes. <laughs> you know, um, you know, having people have questions in their brain, you know, some dissonance in their head. Okay. You know, we got so much stuff every day, all these reports coming from the federal government and all this stuff that, you know, this tech variety model is just one way to make sense of all this because there's just so much happening. I mean, I have so many of these reports coming at me from the, you know, what do you name from the Chronicle, all these articles and so forth. We got books like Clay Shirky's Kind of Surplus, Smart Mobs, you know, from Howard Rheingold, Grown Up Digital, from Don Tapscott, Opening Up Education, a free book from MIT, you know, Disrupting Classes, from Clayton Christensen, DIY University, from Anya Kamenetz, who's a guest in my class, Kevin Kelly's What Technology Wants, great book, highly recommend that in the shallows, both of them, uh, by Nicholas Carr, you know. Um, the Future of the Internet and How to Stop It, by Jonathan Zittrain, all these books are just overwhelming us today. So these 10 principles are one way to wrap your head around what's possible online. Where's your Ritalin? It's just one way to think about things. Okay, and um, let's go to another poll. How many of the ideas did you get so far? 
zero if you're lucky. Let's clear that out. Maybe I can help clear that out. And um, zero if you're lucky. One or two, three to five, six to ten, more than ten. Yeah. <laughs> And A, it should be A, sorry, it should be A, B, C, D. I, I have this numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Sorry about that. So 5 would be a E, 4 would be a D. My apologies there. 3 would be a C, 2 would be a B, 1 would be an A. Got a couple of people still looking for an idea. We can maybe get you some ideas during the Q&A. Or you can send me an email, cjbonk at indiana.edu, or to your friends. I mean, this class is about everybody else. It's, it, you know, these are one-hour sessions we're going to have to augment what's happening in the discussion forums. These are one hour. I think I've spoken for about an hour so far, slightly a little more than an hour. Um, I know some of you will need to leave, and probably had to leave sharply at 5. Glarked. <laughs> Glarked. Some of you have been glabunked. <laughs> All right. So you can see most of you got three to five ideas. Some of you have still yet to post, but that's OK. Um, now I have a question for you. I'm going to post one more free chapter. I've posted chapters um, 3 and 4 up there, I think, for free. I posted a chapter on, uh, on encouragement and feedback with 10 activities. I, I, I did one on tone, uh, chapters uh, 3 and 4. Uh, would you like another one of the 10 activity chapters, 5, 6, or 7, or the recap or the intro? That's all I have done so far. I have five more activity chapters to do. If you were to pick a chapter, and this is your voice, your vote, which of those would you want me to share for free? Just don't tell my publisher. No, I, I don't have a publisher yet. I, I don't want a publisher yet. Uh, that's the next question. You're going to pick my publisher. OK, so right now the preference for, let's keep the votes coming. It's a close vote, either D or B. It's a close vote. Autonomy and choice or curiosity. Let's keep the votes coming in. 79 so far. I'm going to keep it going for another minute or so. 88 to 78. That's a tough, tough call. But we'll look at. Um, if I was voting, I'd go for autonomy and choice. But it's your vote, and we're going to go with curiosity and fun and games. Why not? Okay, makes sense. That's the next one in the sequence, so it makes a lot of sense. Let's look at how I should publish this. Josie Bass is my normal publisher for my other one. We'll talk about next week with 100 activities. You know, and it'll cost you around thirty, forty dollars, and there won't be much free stuff, or maybe a free chapter. Rutledge w would like this, and they'll give away maybe uh, twenty-five free activities or fifty. Amazon Create Space, I give away the whole book for free. Did you? Um, yeah, the whole book would be free with a hardcover book, very cheap. Um, maybe make it in a mobile app, or maybe have a book with fifty activities free and sell the other fifty. So, what's the? Um, what's your choice? Free book in Amazon Create Space. So far, that's the choice. Why don't you go ahead and post the results so people can see the results so far? Can we get the results up there? There we go. Um, so you guys have picked choice three. Go with Amazon. No contest. <laughs> OK, well, I, I told the Jersey Bass people I would ask, and they thought that would be interesting to get the response. But this is a, this is a no-brainer now. Um, maybe I'll do, I'll, do, I'll do C and D, perhaps, or maybe part of E. Just find different ways to give stuff away. But definitely C, then. We'll go with C. Kindle as well. OK. All right. Anderson's book is free. It's a free PDF, I believe. He still sells a paper version if you want it. And I might do the same here. So it will be like Terry Anderson's book, The Theory and Practice of Online Learning. I don't know if that's the last poll we have. Let's see what we have here. Number 14, do you feel motivated to try some of this out? Yes or no? Let's go back to a yes, no question. Can we clear the screen there and go back to a, a yes, no response? Can we go back to a, to a different type of response? Can uh, not sure if you can switch the response, but I guess A would be yes and B would be no. If you go ahead and just leave it like that, that'd be fine. A and B. Okay. Sorry, we've switched the version here. It's a little 
my assistant's coming from Edmonton, so you might have to re-vote. Apologies if you've already voted, but go ahead and re-vote. You feel motivated. <laughs> maybe you need some million dollars, or maybe some real hard currency, or some Canadian stuff up there. Okay, I think we're ready for a break. Maybe we should do one more thing here. We should publish those results. Let's go back and publish those results, um, if you can. 196 to 1, 196 of you feel motivated. So share in the chat window, which of these principles do you think you might use of these 10? This is the tech variety model. They link together. All of them, tone and climate. OK. Carlos says C. <laughs> All right. Major Tom, I saw you up there. Autonomy, relevance, interactivity. <laughs> Relevance and inner autonomy. I see relevance and autonomy popping up in interactivity. Those are the ones. Somebody put QWERTY up there. <laughs> QWERTY. <laughs> or tur turkey, <laughs> by referring to me. All right. Relevance, interactivity. Google Jock. Google Jockey ideas. Right. OK. So this is a lot of stuff. We did a lot here this first week because we had the orientation thing going on here. So we should be a little smoother next week and finish up closer to on time. Um, and so let me click another.